I've just spoken with a fire marshal and uh, take care of a, a few housekeeping issues first off. Uh, he wants to be sure that we're all sitting, um, not, in, and not standing in the aisles or by the exit doors. So if I could ask, it will take a couple more minutes, but if I could ask all of you to find a seat. Um, there are lots up front. Uh, feel free to come up um, and find a seat. Um, we do have, in, in the cafeteria, we have overflow. It doesn't look like we're gonna need it just yet, um, but there is seating in the cafeteria as well. Um, just a, a few more um, housekeep, housekeeping announcements. Um, if everybody could um, notice the exits, um, in the event of emergency, we have exits both up in the front on both the left and the right, and in the back, I feel like a flight attendant. Um, so just be, be mindful of that, um, and everybody will be fine. We are going to, um, we were, and many of you were out last night, we were in, in for, at Portsmouth High, a similar discussion. We did hear um, um, a, some of the comments from last night. We're gonna try and get to your comments much more quickly than we did last night. So we're gonna shorten up the presentation length um, early, at, at the beginning um, so that we can get your comments. We're gonna do it. Um, very similar format to last night, so those of you that weren't there, um, when we finish the, the presentation, we will have a microphone that we'll probably have here in the aisle. Um, and what we're going to do is, we're, and we'll be here as long as you need to, would like to be here tonight. Um, and so we have time for as many people to make um, uh, verbal comments as you would like. Um, it worked out pretty well last night that people would self-judge um, how many people in line at a time when the line got down too short, other people came up. So it worked pretty well and it flowed through and people were able to make their comments. Um, we do have also, um, in the, in the, at the tables when you first came in, there are two forms. Uh, one is a, just a, a, ge a general comment form and the other is a, um, a brief questionnaire that sort of um, has some questions that you can respond to. This is, this is voluntary, you can, you can respond on either one or neither of these. Um, and we will take those and also enter any comments, any written comments, into the official record of, um, of, for the project. Um, all of your comments tonight are also being recorded. We have a stenographer up here in the front, um, and it's also what we are saying um, is um, up on the screen, so if there's anybody um, with a, with a listen, uh, hearing impairment, um, the screen's available for you as well. Um, and feel free, if you're not, can't see or if you're having trouble hearing, raise a hand and there are some more seats up front. We're going to go through, um, again, similar to last night, but a little compressed. We're going to do a little bit of a, um, an overview of why we're here talking about potential putting up tolls on the Sakonic Bridge. And I, it's not lost on me that this is not a popular, this is not a popular proposal. But we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the reasons why this is being considered. Um, we're going to talk about the, a little bit of the background of how transportation is funded in the state, um, a little bit on the situation on the funding of the Turnpike and Bridge Authority. And then we're going to talk about specifically what is being proposed. Um, what is the toll that is being proposed? Where is it being proposed? And then um, briefly on some of the um, early outreach that we've done, which is part of the process. But then also importantly, um, we'll talk about what the, the initial traffic analysis uh, that we've done on uh, if tolls are implemented, what does that do to traffic, and then um, what other impacts does that have. Most importantly though, this is about public comment. This is about an opportunity for us uh, at RIDOT to hear from you on the concerns that you have um, about the proposal to put tolls on the Sakonic Bridge. And again, we'll be here as long as you have comments as long as you would like to be here, um, and we'll stay here um, and record all of that. Again, why, why, where did this come from? Where's this idea? Um, there was, what is in current state law, it was passed in the FY13 budget, um, it was um, passed by the legislature last year, signed by the governor into law um, at, in, at, uh, in July, early July, and what it does is Article 20 of the budget authorizes the transfer of the Sakonet River Bridge, the new Sakonet River Bridge, and the Jamestown Bridge from RIDOT. We currently, RIDOT currently has 
control ownership of the bridge, responsibility for maintenance of those bridges. It authorizes us to transfer those bridges to the Rhode Island Turnpike and Bridge Authority with the intention that the Turnpike and Bridge Authority, in order to have the funds to adequately maintain them, would institute tolls on the Sakonic Bridge. That's a summary of what the law says. So what we're doing is, what do we have to do to implement that law? And one of the things that we have to do is we have to do uh, what's called an environmental reevaluation. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the when the when the Sconet went um, was constructed or when it was first planned 10 years ago. The proposal was to put up tolls to pay for the construction of the bridge, um, and that because we are that was not how the the bridge was paid for. It's paid for with other funds. Um, we have to do a reevaluation because we're talking about now introducing tolls not to pay for the construction, but to pay for the maintenance of the bridge. And I'll get into a little bit more of what that, um, what that process is. Um, so as you all, just a little bit of background again. As you all know, the current bridges that are under the jurisdiction of the Turnpike and Bridge Authority are the Newport Pell Bridge and the Mount Hope Bridge. So that's all the in infrastructure that the Turnpike and Bridge is responsible for. And they collect tolls on the Pell Bridge, and those tolls pay for the maintenance of both bridges. Right now, the revenues that they're taking in from tolls are insufficient to take care of the capital program needs, the, the, the repairs that are needed to those um, very significant bridges. So what this proposal is, what the, law, what, the, what the budget passed, the budget article that passed in the FY2013 budget was to transfer the Sakonet Bridge and the Jamestown Bridge to the Rhode Island Turnpike Bridge Authority. They would introduce tolls on Sakonet. Tolls from the Pell and the Sakonet would pay for the maintenance of all four bridges. It would become a four-bridge system instead of what it is now as a two-bridge system. Now, I'm going to be very quick on this because this, I think, there's a lot of people. There were people frustrated last night with the length that I went into this. This is a, just a simple model of how the transportation funding is provided in Rhode Island right now. We have three sources on the top. We, have, we get federal money from the Federal Highway Administration, the USDOT. That's the green. We borrow, historically have borrowed, issued general obligation bonds to get access to that money. And the only source of revenue currently in the state of Rhode Island for transportation is the state gas tax. Where those monies go are in the lower left, that's the money that we use for our capital improvement project. Repairing bridges, repaving roads, putting up traffic signals, doing safety projects. It comes out of that money middle bucket on the bottom, that's the debt service we have to pay on all of the borrowing that's been done over the last several decades. That takes up a lot of our revenues, almost $100 million of our revenues go to debt service. It's the bottom bucket on the right, though, this is really why we're here. That's what's left over for all the maintenance of all the highways and bridges in the state. And because it's not the gas, full gas tax, because that had to go to, to debt service, it's just what's left over after we pay for the gas tax after we pay for the debt service. And that's the problem, is we, there aren't enough funds left to even begin to maintain all of the roughly 800 bridges in the state and all of the roadways. And that's the problem. That includes the Sakonet and the Jamestown. Now, some of you have questions. Where does the state gas tax go today? How much is it? Where does it go? The total Rhode Island state gas tax is 33 cents in the bottom middle column. That's what we collect every time we fill up the tank. 33 cents of every gallon um, that we pay goes to the, Rhode Island, um, to, the, to the state gas tax. Of that, DOT gets um, a total of 21.75 cents. Of the 33 cents, RIDOC gets what's in yellow, it's the 21.75 cents. RIPTA gets 9.75 cents for their operations. That's the only source of state revenue for RIPTA's operations. Department of uh, Human Services gets a penny, and what that's for is for the ride program for the elderly and disabled in order to get a, um, get a ride. Um, DHS, a penny of gas tax, goes back to RIPTA to fund the ride service statewide. A half penny is for underground storage tank, um, environmental remediation for um, underground storage tanks. That's the gas tax, that's where it goes. Now in the past, some of the gas tax went to other things besides transportation. 
Some of it went to the general fund. That's not the case today, and it hasn't been the case for several years. The gas tax goes to transportation, but that's how it's split out. Um, very quickly, um, the gas tax, what the state is taking in from the gas tax every year over the last five years has been dropping. Um, and it's dropped about a half a million dollars for every penny that we take in. We get a half a million less than we did just five years ago. What that means, over the last five years, we're, we get 17 million less in income from the same 33 cent gas tax. And that's because people are driving less and cars fuel efficiency is going up. So that's why there's less revenue coming just from the gas tax. Where that gas tax goes to ride out right now, the 21.75 cents, the red part of the pie and the, the pumpkin colored part of the pie, that's the debt service we pay. For all the past borrowing the state has done for transportation, more than half of what we take in in the gas tax goes to debt. It's not available to us for plowing the snow or fixing potholes or, or taking care of the bridges across the state. The green is the, is the RIDOT maintenance personnel. Those are the folks that plow the snow, fix the potholes, repair the lights, cut the grass, and all those other typical operations things. Um, and that's the green. Um, winter maintenance is the blue. It's the next biggest part. Um, and that is um, we, what, how we budget that is we average, we try to average every five years so we don't hit the highs and the lows. But just two years ago, we had a very snowy winter. And in 2012, it was budgeted at 7.5 million for maintenance. Um, two years ago, we spent 18 million on, win on winter maintenance because of the heavy snow. So it can be a big impact if we just have a bad year, a bad winter. So this is why, this is all the money that's available to do all of the maintenance on all of the infrastructure across the state. And there just strict, there just isn't enough to even begin to take care of the maintenance needs for all the structures. So this proposal, what's in the law, is to provide a dedicated source of revenue to ensure the, uh, the maintenance of the New Saganet River Bridge and the Jamestown Bridge. That's why this is being proposed. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through this. I'm, the only point I'm going to talk about this is I said earlier that we used to borrow all of our money so that we, from the state so that we could get access to the federal money. And that's what built up this big backlog of debt, almost $454 million in outstanding debt. Last year's budget changed that so that over the course of the next several years, we'll no longer be borrowing to get access to the federal money. We'll become a pay-as-you-go state. So we will not be increasing our debt load. We're going to flatten off, and eventually the, the debt um, will go down, and there'll be more money available for maintenance. It's very important. But the way they did that is the legislature raised the registration and license fees. Your current registration and license fees go into the general fund. They don't go to transportation. This increase over the next three years will go to offset um, what used to be borrowing so that we can get access to the federal money. But it doesn't go for any new, op new, new operations. It doesn't go for maintenance. It's not available for that. It's only available so that we can get access to the federal money to do the capital project repairs in the state that are so needed. This slide is from Back in 2008, um, there was a blue ribbon panel report done by the prior governor. A number of uh, folks around the state were on this panel to determine what were the transportation funding needs in the state. This is back in 2008. And what it identified is that at that time, all toll, the state took in about $350 million in revenues for all transportation. That would be RIPTA included. But the need that was identified was 639 uh, million dollars, a 285 million dollar a year shortfall to get into a state of good repair. And the, the block of the green that I just want to point out, we spend about 40 million dollars a year on our maintenance. That's what we have available after the debt is paid. What was identified as a need annually to adequately maintain the roads and bridges is over 100 million dollars. So there's a very big gap in what is available to adequately maintain the roads and bridges compared to what is needed. And that's, again, why we're here. Now, quickly, the Turnpike and Bridge Authority. Turnpike and Bridge Authority, as I said, has jurisdiction over the Pell and the Mount Hope Bridges. It 
collect the toll. The only source of revenue they have is the toll that's collected on the Pell Bridge, and that revenue takes care of the maintenance and the capital improvements for both bridges. They've completed a 10-year capital plan, a look ahead, what is needed to be done on those two bridges. The Mount Hope, as you all know, is 82 years old. The Pell is more than 40 years old, and they need, in order to maintain them in a sound structural condition, they need maintenance. In order to, over the next 10 years, they are, the Turnpike and Bridge is short about $60 million over that 10 year period to, be, to adequately fund that 10 year capital plan. That's, that's painting the bridges, that's fixing steel that needs repair, um, it's fixing the road deck. Um, other maintenance is needed to ensure those bridges are sound and safe for the future. So the red up there is their shortfall. The current, re the current tolls that they collect on the Pell Bridge over 10 years are about $60 million short of what they need. So if you take those two, those two needs together, the short, what the Turnpike and Bridge is short to adequately maintain, the Pell and, and the Mount Hope Bridge, and the fact that RIDOT strict, simply doesn't have the revenue stream needed to properly maintain the brand new Sakonet Bridge or the Jamestown Bridge, or for that matter, more than 700 bridges across the state. So what, and what makes these bridges unique? These four bridges out of the roughly 800, 800 bridges across the state make up 20% of the deck area of the bridges of the state. So four bridges, 20% of all the deck area of all the bridges in, in the state. The other thing is, as we all know, you know better than most, is the water they cross, they cannot, we can't, do emergency repairs like we're forced to do on many of the other bridges around the state, too many of the other bridges around the state that look like this. We have hundreds of bridges around the state that look like this. Um, and they are deteriorating. They're now shored up temporarily to keep them safe. These are on a backlog of projects that we need to do in order to fix them and make sure that they're, they're there for the state to use. We simply can't do this kind of repair on these high ocean crossing bridges. So the East Bay Bridge System is designed to put those four bridges together, to have two revenue sources, one from the north, north and one from the south, to go into a pool to take care of those four bridges and only those four bridges, not any of the other bridges across the state. Now, one of the questions that was, that's raised, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it again tonight, is why tolls here, why only here, why not the rest of the state? As I said, there is Tolling the Sakonet Bridge isn't going to help RIDOT address the needs across the state. What all it does is it ensures that the Sakonet and the Jamestown are adequately maintained, just like the Mount Hope and the, and the Pell. It doesn't fix our problems across the state. Like these very large structures that are so important to the economy of this region, the interstate highway, I-95, 295, 105, 195, are really the lifeblood of the state for moving goods and services through the state and around the state. We, it is underfunded. We have proposed, RIDOT has proposed, that we also study or in, and implement tolling on the interstate. Now we put, in a, we put in an application to the federal government a year ago, and the, the problem is, and, the, and I've talked to a few folks independently at the beginning of the meeting, current federal law prohibits states for tolling the existing interstate highway. Current federal law prohibits that. There were three exceptions that were made over the last decade um, that are no longer available. Missouri was granted an exception. Virginia was granted an exception. And um, now North Carolina was granted an exception, North Carolina most recently this past year, for I-95, for tolling I-95. Those three exemptions are filled. Current federal law doesn't allow any more. The current federal law is only two years long, however. What we're trying to do in Rhode Island and Many states across the country are trying to get the flexibility in the next federal law that gives the states the opportunity to make that decision for themselves. Make us a, a local decision. Do we want to raise monies for transportation through tolling or not? And to keep that at the local level. The difference is the Sakonet Bridge, Route 24, is not on the federal aid system. It doesn't come under that prohibition for tolling, which is what I-95 does. Um, I just now a little bit about the, the process that we're in. Um, again, what did this 
what, what initiated this whole discussion? Back in 2008, the Blue Ribbon Panel said this state is underfunded in transportation. It listed a, a number of um, options for um, increasing revenues in the state. Um, one of them was tolling the Sakonet. One of them was raising the gas tax. Another was um, uh, increasing the registry licensing fees. Um, there were other, other options that were identified. In May of 2011, there was a Senate commission that was established that looked at this same issue. What are the opportunities within the state? None of this is easy. None of this is popular. What are the opportunities within the state that we can look to solve some of the problems? One of the items that was identified by the Senate Commission was, again, studying tolling um, on the interstate and other locations. Now, that led to the article in last year's budget, which is authorizing the transfer. That was the only item in the budget with regard to transportation um, uh, that was in the budget. Um, and that was what's approved in July. So that's the existing law in the state, is the authorization to transfer those two bridges from RIDOT to the Turnpike Bridge Authority, establish a toll in order to adequately maintain the four bridge system. That's what's in current state law. Now, with that, as that was being developed, that legislation was being developed, the hearings were being held up at the State House, uh, we began the process uh, knowing that we had to go, we were, we had to um, produce an environmental reevaluation. Can I take a quick break before the fire marshal gets on me? You folks that are standing up, there are a lot of seats that are open here um, on both sides and in the middle. If I can ask you to um, find open seats, if some of your neighbors can raise a hand to show where the open seats are. Um, my guess is this is going to be a long evening, and I think you're going to want to sit down. Thank you. There's a lot down, there are quite a few down here. There are at least a dozen down here. Thanks. Okay. So we began the, the Evaluation. We needed to look at what changed from the environmental impact statement that was done on this building the Sakonet Bridge, um, and obviously introducing a toll changes things. Um, so we have to look at what are the traffic impacts of that, what are the social impacts of that, are there air quality impacts of that, are there congestion impacts of that, economic impacts of that. That's the process we're in right now. And we're in the middle of the process, and one of the things that we identified is that we wanted to come out and hold these meetings so that we could provide an opportunity for all of you comment on this as we're preparing it, so that becomes part of our evaluation. Um, so everything that is said tonight, all of the written comments that come in are going to be part of this environmental reevaluation document, so that when we submit that to the Federal Highway Administration, they have the benefit of all of your input. Um, June, the article passed, and we're having the public outreach sessions now. We hope to complete our evaluation writing of the report um, early in the new year. We would then submit it to Federal Highway for their review. Federal Highway then determines what they do. They um, will review it. They will determine whether we have done sufficient analysis, whether we need to do more analysis, whether we need to have more public input. Um, and I, we don't control that. It's up to the Federal Highway Administration to determine what is the next step. We need to submit the report to them with all the input, and then they tell us what we need to do with that. If the Federal um, Highway approves that, and this is an open um, question, uh, we would, at the end of the Federal Review, and assuming they say, okay, you've covered all of the issues that need to be covered in federal law, and you identified the mitigation that needs to be done, then the earliest, the earliest that a toll could actually go up on the Sagata Bridge is as early as this summer. That's the earliest it could happen. That's all dependent on what the, the, the process um, going forward is. So that's the process we're in, and that's how these meetings fit into the process. To take your input so that we can keep it as part of the record um, on, uh, on what we're doing. Sir. Yes. 
No, we're, we're prepared. We're, the, the law was passed. The, the, the gentleman asked the question, if the, the review was being done by the Federal Highway in the, in the, in the winter of 2013, and he said that's after the decision was being made. It was after the state law was passed authorizing the transfer. We can't implement the tolls until the federal review is complete and they give us the ability to go forward with that. So we can't do any, we can't act on this until the federal review is complete. I'm going to answer this question, and then I'm going to ask that, because this could go a long time. I think those types of questions we definitely want to have at the, at the question period. But the gentleman asked, his, his understanding was that Federal Highway had already given us the approval and that we don't need anything more. That's not true. We, there's a, the federal process is that we have, we have an existing what's called a record of decision for the environmental impact statement was done on the building of the Sakana Bridge. That record of decision, that environmental impact statement, assumed that there would be no tolling on the bridge. So we have to reopen the environmental statement, assess the impacts, and then the Federal Highway Administration will determine whether we've done sufficient analysis, whether they require us to do more analysis, whether they require us to um, identify additional mitigation, or whether they require us to, um, uh, to extend the comment period. Those are still open, and I can't speak for Federal Highway. They're, they know we're doing this. We've briefed them on what our process is, they, they, they've given us indication we're doing the right process, but the, the conclusion hasn't been reached. Who did, could I ask who that, I'm surprised at that. Uh, you just sent it to me, I'd definitely like to see that. That's not, that's, that, we, we haven't filed with them yet, and I'm not sure they could say that. Okay. Um, we did just a, some of you have seen the, um, uh, we've tried to reach out in advance of this meeting, um, particularly to the businesses of the region, um, to, to, to seek input onto what the specific impacts that individual business owners um, would have from the introduction of a toll. Again, that's part of the process. Um, we have the same form um, here tonight. Uh, we'll make that available. It's available online. We want to get as much input as we can because um, that helps um, uh, us to understand where the impacts are going to be um, and, and enable us to complete our study. Um, we had a number, again, number of outreach. We got 70 um, comments in last night. We, our original solicitation, I think, was 140 um, went out to people. But again, as many as more comments that we get in, the better. Um, so we'll. I'm going to ask, if I, if I can ask to hold off on the questions, because I think I, I, I already broke my own rule. What I'm, going to, I'm going to finish up very soon, and then we're going to get to all the questions. Um, now, one of, the, one of the big questions, how is the toll rate established? First of all, I want to say, the actual, if this goes forward, the actual toll rate is established by the Turnpike and Bridge Authority. Now, what the current estimates are in order to adequately maintain the four bridges, that'd be the Pell, the Mount Hope, the Jamestown, and the Sakana, based on the capital program needs and the operation and maintenance needs for the four bridges for the next 10 years, um, is about $38 million a year total. So the revenue source from both the Pell and from the Sakana would have to equal about $38 million a year to cover what the identified needs for those four bridges are over the next 10 years. So there, you know, there've been some comments about you know, how much money, if you, you know, what rate are you going to apply? It's a cash cow. It only needs the rate, the average rate, only needs to be enough to meet that roughly thirty-eight million dollar need. It's a big number, but it is. It's a limited number. It's a fixed number. Um, the many of you know in the legislation there is also a provision for something called the East Bay Infrastructure Fund. What that was originally, the idea of that was that if there are any excess toll revenues, they could go into a, um, a fund that would go to transportation improvements in the East Bay. We've heard loudly, and 
and frequently from a lot of you folks last night and in previous meetings that that is not something that this region is in favor of. So, you know, our assumptions is that number is zero for the East Bay Infrastructure Fund. So all the toll rate needs to do is be established to meet the maintenance needs of the four bridges, not for any other transportation purposes. We can go into that in a little bit more detail. But with that, there are, as you know, on the Pell Bridge today, and what we did our analysis on is based on the existing Pell Bridge rate, which is, um, has a, a number of different rates. If you're a cash customer without an Easy Pass, it's $4 each way, current Pell rate. If you have a Rhode Island Easy Pass, it's 83 cents each way. If you are um, an out-of-state um, commuter and you have an easy, a Rhode Island Easy Pass, and you have a frequent user discount, it equates to about 91 cents a trip. Then there's a commercial rate. So all of those blended rates um, currently equal what the Turnpike is, is taking in right now. Depending on how, what the rate needs, there are other opportunities for rate reductions, um, and that's on local trips or um, business, small businesses. There are, there are other opportunities as long as the, the net gets you to the $38 million need. And that hasn't been established yet. Um, just quickly, where to, and, and a little bit more on that. Uh, it's a little bit of a complex slide, but today, just on the Pell Bridge, passenger cars, as I said, um, 15% of the traffic pays the $4 rate. That would be a Rhode Islander who doesn't have an easy pass or somebody from out of state who might have an out of state easy pass um, or fast lane from Massachusetts. They would pay the $4. So that only accounts for 15% of all the traffic that crosses the Pell. Um, the biggest number is roughly 70% of the traffic is paying 83 cents a crossing. So when you blend all of that, it's a much lower rate than the $4. A very small percentage of the traffic actually pays that $4 rate. Um, and we can get into that more as people have questions on that. Again, um, possible ways to reduce the impacts. Um, reduce local easy pass rates. Um, depending, maybe it's, uh, you know, and I know from Tiverton and Portsmouth, um, many of you cross the bridge several times a day. You're going to work, you're going to school, you're going shopping, um, you're going to the doctors. Um, maybe, you know, there might be an opportunity to say, you know what, you cross the bridges once a day and you only charge once a day. Or you, you cross it 10 times a day, you're only charged once a day. You charge once in a 24 hour period. There's, there may be opportunities to do that. There may be opportunities to some local businesses. I'm not sure if your business is on both sides of the bridge. Um, that's an impact on a small business. No. That's the Turnpike and Bridges decision. All I'm gonna do is, I'm up here. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, what I'm suggesting is, the, the question is here, he was, I think he was suggesting I was being disingenuous. Okay. Um, he's, no, it's a great question. The Turnpike and Bridge Board is the, is the entity that it will actually decide what the bridge, what the toll rates are. But I want you to keep in mind that that is, the rates need to be established to meet that need, which is in the, um, they are appointed. They're appointed by the, by the board. Okay. But that, no, 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 it's a, no, it's a good point. He, uh, the gentleman raised the point and you make a valid point. I just want to be very clear. The establishment of the toll rate would be by the Turnpike and Bridge Board, of, of which I, I do sit on the board. Now the, the, just, thank you, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. The, 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 the tolls that were being proposed for the Sakonet would not be toll boost. There would not be cash. It's all electronic tolling. This is where the tolling is going across the country. Um, so that if you have an easy pass, you just go through, there's no stopping. If you don't have an easy pass, um, it would photograph your license, you would get a bill in the mail, and you'd be charged that way. On the Sakonet, on the Sakonet Bridge, um, roughly 60% of the users of the Sakonet are, are you folks. 
It's local traffic. Local traffic makes up 60% of the trips across the Sakonet. Massachusetts is the balance, is the, the bulk of the rest, about 34%. All right, and now um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to quickly ask uh, Rick Gobeil to talk a little bit about what are the traffic, what the, um, the traffic analysis that we've done to date, um, what are the impacts, if, assuming a toll goes into place on Sakonet, what would those impacts be? All right, I promise I'll be quick. Um, we were asked to do a study and what would happen to the traffic on the Sakonet River Bridge if we applied tolls at the same rate they are on the Pell Bridge. Uh, we looked at a couple different locations. We looked at a location, do you have the pointer? Yeah. Just right in the center button. Okay. Um, between the Massachusetts State Line and, and Fish Road, we looked at another location uh, between Fish Road and Main Road. We looked on the bridge, and we looked at another location over here in Portsmouth. Um, what would happen if the toll were collected in those locations? Okay, um, these numbers compare to what would happen if the toll was collected somewhere other than on the bridge itself. Um, if the toll was collected by the Massachusetts State Line, there'd be 61% less people paying a toll than if it was on the bridge, but that would result in a lot more traffic on the local streets avoiding the toll, and it would have to be a higher toll to generate the same amount of revenue. Similarly, on the Portsmouth side, be 21 percent less traffic which would be a higher toll and there'd be a, a lot of local impacts there so we looked at it as though the toll was going to be on the Sakana River Bridge and we uh, did an analysis of that all right and this is what we found when a toll similar to what's on the Pell Bridge was introduced there would be about 21 percent less traffic on the Sakana River Bridge, then we'll be there if it's free. So that about one in five trips would no longer use that facility. Um, where would they go? Well, there's a fair number of trips that go here between these two locations. Um, they use both bridges. They would go around this way from Bristol to Tiverton. All right. Same thing as. Okay. Go ahead, J ladies there, and gentlemen. Just Rick, is on, I've got two more slides, and then we're going to get in all the questions. Okay. All right. There would also be traffic that would then use the Mount Hope Bridge to avoid paying a toll in the Tiverton. And there would be more traffic in the Bristol area. There would be less traffic in the Tiverton area than there is now. And that's what would happen if you introduce tolls at a rate similar to what's on the Pell Bridge. Okay? All right. Thanks, Rick. Um, so that there will be, there will be impact. Clearly, um, there will be a change in some traffic patterns. Some traffic that is on this side of the bridge will stay on this side of the bridge and circulate here. Some of the traffic that is, is origin is on the Portsmouth side would stay on the Portsmouth side. There is a there is a change, and as Rick pointed out, at a toll rate similar to the Pell, there'd be a 21 percent reduction in the traffic. Any rate lower than that would be somewhat less of a, a diversion as the as the as the rate goes down, there'd be less diversion. So let me, before we go to um, the comment period, I just want to leave these up here. This is, these are ways you can contact us. Leave, in, leave your comments, written form, by email or otherwise. Um, and again, we want as many comments and many commenters as we can. Now, the way we did this last night, and I think it worked out, is we're going to put the... Um,